Hi, I'm Paul Goddard, clinical hypnotherapist and master practitioner of neuro-linguistic programming. This is my interview with Miguel Dean, author of Stepping Stones in the Mist, Life's Lessons for Overcoming Adversity. It's a fantastic book that talks about a troubled upbringing to his life of living on the streets and becoming a traveler for a while to eventually turning his life round and becoming an inspirational speaker and life coach. I interviewed him on Full Moon Summer Solstice, a special time for Miguel. I don't really need to say anymore, just relax, sit back and enjoy this amazing story from this wonderful man. Okay, so Miguel, thank you for joining me today and allowing me this time for the interview. I've got your fantastic book here that I've just finished last night, Stepping Stones in the Mist, so you can just sit here. I'll just put a close-up as well so people can see. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I've noticed about this book is that you're incredibly honest, which was actually a breath of fresh air for me because it's nice to read that, you know, I do my own practice, my own NLP. We've all got this stuff going on inside our head. Mm-hmm. How easy did you find it to come out and be open and honest like that? Or was there anything which you struggled to get down on the paper? Um, it, it, it was pretty easy, really, um, because it, I, I guess it's, it's just how I am. And the book... I, uh, yeah, there was an intention when I wrote the book that I didn't, I didn't want it to be edited. Uh, I didn't want to sort of self-edit it. Um, I wrote it very quickly, uh, and it just kind of like fell out of me. And um, you know, I be- really believe that honesty and um, authenticity, transparency. Uh, you know, I think they're a really big key part in what's causing some of the challenges, shall we say, in the world. Uh, you know, because w- when we're not honest and when we don't own fully who we are, then we kind of isolate bits of ourselves and we're fragmented and, and, and we're not in 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 our full power, if you like. Um, you know, the strange paradox it seems to be that the more open and honest you are, the more you do actually step into your authentic power because there's nothing to hide. There's no secrets. I don't, I've got a terrible memory, so I'd be useless at being dishonest because I'd never remember what I said and what I didn't say and so on. And I just find if you're honest, then, um, you know, you've, you've got nothing to worry about and everything's a bit more relaxed and, and it gives other people permission to be honest as well and to be imperfect because uh, I think that's part of the human condition that we are sort of perfect in our imperfection, if you like. Yeah. So this book, when I went to your talk at the Isbourne, a lot of people were very um, praising it and said how good it was and how much it helped them. Um, It also takes a great deal of guts to, I think, self-publish as well because you're putting everything on, well, not everything online, but a lot of things on the line. Mm. And for a lot of people, they might well think that actually going to publisher and and getting that sort of stamp of approval, it's like, yes, I can can publish it now. Mm. David Hamilton, I interviewed recently, has been incredibly successful and his books were rejected, but the very first one he written he self-published it as well mm. what what strength did you get inside to think yes I'm actually going to do this and I'm going to put all the effort in and, and sell my books yeah um, it, I came to the decision to, to self-publish quite quickly it, it didn't take take very long at all really and, and I think it just seemed that the whole publishing thing just seemed a bit more complicated um, and that there was the possibility that I might have to compromise and sort of negotiate and um, I just wanted it to be just just as it was, you know. I, I didn't want it, as I say, I didn't really want to edit it, or I didn't want any. I certainly didn't want anybody else editing it. So I guess I'm quite. When I decide to do something, I, I just do it, and I don't always think terribly well into the advance and kind of like think it through. It just felt like no, th- this is the, this is the right way to do it, um, and I didn't really know where it was going to go you know what what was going to um you know how successful it would be or how popular it would be or it, yeah it, it's funny isn't it when you know the the first time somebody reads it it's just like well they might say this is a load of crap like you know or they might really like it so yeah i i 
it was it wasn't so much a sort of mental decision it was more of a sort of like heart just gut decision of this just feels like the right thing to do so this is what i'm going to do okay yeah anybody that wishes to self-publish themselves what advice and tips would you give to them to really get a book going and, and make sure they speak from the heart which this certainly does mm. well yeah i i think um uh, you know as, as i say just I think if you write from the heart, then it speaks to people's hearts, you know, then, then it will touch people's hearts. And that's a really big theme for me as well, in that I feel that we've got a little bit too stuck in the head. And uh, my understanding of being healthy and, and being whole is when there's a balance of kind of head and heart, if you like, the sort of feeling centre and, and, and the sort of thinking centre. Um, I'm probably, in a way, I'm not the best person to give advice about the, the self-publishing. Uh, well, well, no, I am because I, I can say that there are lots of things that I would do differently and don't do it the same way that I did it. Um, in that when I finished writing the book it, and, 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 and it was self-published and you know, all, that, all that stuff happened, it felt a bit like, OK, that's the end of the journey. But actually what I realise now is, in a way, it's the beginning of the journey. And... Um, these days it, it seems that if you really want to get something out there on a big scale you've really got to um, embrace all the social media and the internet and all that online stuff if, if you really want to get it out there so um my, my books are my th this book I, I would say has had a sort of it's had a, a steady trickle and it, in a way it was kind of like a practice a sort of experiment you know so and, you know, I'm a great believer in the there's no such thing as failure there's just feedback so I've had plenty of uh, feedback for me of, of how I would do it differently and, and I think the key thing is getting the marketing getting the marketing right um, because I do find myself feeling a little frustrated that you know as time goes on and uh, there's another book that that is rising in me and so I know that the, this next one will be done very differently. Um, yeah, so I think the key thing, it, it depends what you want in, in a way uh, as well, you know, whether, you know, whether the, the intention behind the book is, is it to bring some income in? Um, is it part of your sales funnel? Um, or is it just a sort of act of service? Which I, I guess that was, that was mostly what it was about for me. Uh, I didn't really know what I was doing. It was just I just felt this urge in me. People, well, people kept saying, "You've got a really interesting story. You know, you you should write a book." And my initial thing was, it doesn't feel that interesting to me. You know, it's just it's just my life. It, it's just what's happened. Um, but I, yeah, I I think the important thing is um, the intention that that you set and and just you know just 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 keep going forward just keep going forward with, with whatever feels right for you whether you decide that you want to make, make it go try and make it go really big I mean it's just been lovely for me it, it feels for me, me it's like a seed and whenever somebody buys a copy or um, it feels like great that's another little seed out in the world uh, and as you know it, you know it says at the back when you've read it please don't let it gather dust on a shelf pass it on so I guess in a way that kind of illustrates yeah, I'm kind of working this out a little bit as I talk that, yeah, my intention wasn't... If my intention was about selling loads and making loads of money, I wouldn't have put that at the, at the back. It, it was that I wanted it to be read by as many people as possible um, because I felt that, that it could help. Yeah. yeah. At the beginning, you had quite a upsetting childhood by losing your mum, which you were very young at the time, so couldn't quite remember. But mm -hmm. then what was very painful to you was you, your aunt that you were taken away from, so it was like a second loss. Anybody, a child that's out there, or somebody a little later in life that may have gone through or going through something like that now, what could you say to them to maybe if they're listening to this to help ease the pain that they may be going through right now? Mm. Yeah. Well, th there's a quote that, that comes to mind by uh, Warren Buffett that says that the children almost broken by the world are the ones most likely to save it. Now, I, I don't really like the word save. I don't feel like I'm here to save the world or anything. I don't believe that the world needs saving. I believe it's all unfolding in, in the way it's meant to. But at the same time, I, I want to contribute um, to the change and so on and, and, and 
moving things through as smoothly as possible with as little suffering uh, that needs to happen you know to the planet and, and to humanity so I, th I think the key thing for me you know we, we have two options when when tough stuff happens we can become a victim and we can kind of like go downhill and, and become bitter and, and kind of close up you know sort of close your heart or or you can say I'm going to use this I'm going to use this uh, you know as a, a as a step to, to really step up um, and you know it's all about perspective isn't it? it I choose to see my challenges as gifts the things that happen is I have two options I can either as I say I can be really miserable and depressed and the world's a horrible place and poor me or I can say okay I've had experience of this so this puts me in a really good position to be able to empathize and to be able to help other people so when tough stuff happens um, you, you're going to feel the pain of it and, and it's going to be it's going to be challenging but if you choose to well there's always light at the end of the tunnel and it's your choice how quickly you move towards that light I guess yeah when you were a traveler and you were with nature it, it there was some times which it was quite a dark time like you mentioned about being attacked at one stage of a nine bar that wasn't the first time you were attacked mm. were there any real moments of beauty being that close to nature that you would like to say to people yeah, yes yes there were but it, 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 that's a, it's a really good question it's a really current question for me actually because I'm actually just I'm in a sort of transitional phase of my life and I'm my number one option of, of, of what of what the next stepping stone looks like is to move into a yurt on the land and, and get really back close to nature now the, the funny thing is it, it, it kind of feels like a spiral in, in a way it's like oh right you're going back to living in a tent and all that sort of stuff but I'm such a different person and, and now I would it will be in a much more conscious way in a way when I was back in my new age traveller days I was in so much pain and I was so numb and so out of my face most of the time that I didn't really appreciate it and I didn't connect with it you know it's kind of like you can be surrounded about the mo by the most beautiful stuff you could be in paradise but if inside yourself you're in pain you can't see the beauty and, and, and you're not really connecting kind of thing so there was yeah I mean I don't think I appreciated it at the time when I look back you know if I could do those things again you know there were so many wonderful nights about spent around open fires you know under the sky with musical instruments and you know a few beers and invariably and, and whatever <laughs> else um, you know I remember helping to plant replant the Caledonian forest in the highlands of, of Scotland you know and, and the the beauty up there is you know I did I, I did recognize it even then even through all the sort of numbness and, and the sort of unconsciousness that, that, that I was living at the time um, and, and I think there was a and I think just being close to nature even though I wasn't aware of it fully did play a part in sort of healing and helping catalyze my growth and my development sort of thing to get to a point where I decided I really need to step up here and start living a different life before yeah. that happened there was a stage when you were on the streets of Edinburgh begging for money right. and as you said to actually be able to do it a few beers actually helped you to be out on the street yeah. there are times when I see somebody on the street and I often wonder what would that person like me to do I sometimes think maybe just a chat with them they might quite like maybe giving them money might be the best option for them because that's what makes them happy or going off and buying them a, a cup of coffee from what your experience is what would be the most kindest and helpful thing to you if you could go back and help yourself at that time mm. yeah um is it i'm not sure that i ever it's all a bit blurry but i'm not sure if i ever remember anybody stopping and kind of crouching down you know just getting down to my level and just having a conversation with me as a sort of human to human it's that whole thing of you know, just the levels you're down on the floor and they're walking and they're up there I've been asked a, a similar question before and, and I yeah I, I do think that it, it's good to it's good to ask 
the uh, homeless person the, the question i'd like to help is there anything that i can you know, that i can do um and it may be a coffee or it may be you know is it, is it all right if i sit down and have a chat with you for a bit because i think that human connection is and just to be heard and just to be seen and just be recognized can move mountains you know it, it can be a, a just something or sort of switches inside you when somebody really hears you and really sees you um and, and a lot of people say you know should should you give homeless people money that they're probably just going to spend it on drugs or, or beer or, or whatever and and my response to that is just give give your gift you give your gift with no strings attached and if they choose to spend it on drugs or or, or beer or, or food or, or whatever that's their choice and it, it, it's still a gift as long as it's given given with love because my experience is that most of the time people that are taking drugs are taking drugs to numb the pain it's it's kind of self-medication and i'm not i don't draw a massive distinction between going to the doctors and getting antidepressants or some tablets from them or self-medicating with cannabis or something like that you know it, it, it's really although it's not a, a conscious decision but i think that that's generally what's happening it's numbing the pain because everybody has a story and i don't believe anybody ends up on the street out of choice and because they think it's a really nice idea uh, it's because something has happened you know it's usually equated to sort of low self-worth this is what i this is the best that i believe that i'm worthy of so yeah ask the question just you know it's always, always good to ask the ask what, what i'd like to help what is it all right if i sit down and have a chat uh, would you like a cup of coffee can i give you a few quid um and as long as it's given from a yeah from a from a loving space i think uh it will contribute and it will make a difference to that person yeah, that's good advice um there's a story which I, I, I read in this book and it's when you come across a pheasant and it was caught in brambles I think and trying to get out and the more it tried to fight its way through the more pain it was causing itself mm -hmm. but when it actually faced its fear and came to you um, it, 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 it managed to fly away so mm -hmm. that actually I know it's something I knew deep down inside it's something that seemed to really resonate with me when you, you, you put that mm -hmm. um, were there any other sort of stories and metaphors when either you were on or you know in the streets or when you were um, camping or when you were later on in life a, a good metaphor that you would like to to share with somebody like that because that really did do something for me okay okay the the, the donkey story yeah um, so shall I just share briefly the story yeah. okay yeah so there's, there's a an old grey donkey and um, He's a curious sort of animal and he's wandering around the, the farm where he lives one day and he comes across in, in a sort of corner of the farm that he's not explored before um, an old well and he being a curious sort of donkey he jumps up um, on, onto the edge of the well to look down to, to see what, what what's down there but as he's a bit old and not terribly um, firm on his feet he, he slips and he falls down into the well there isn't a splash it's more of a thud because it's an old dry well and to begin with the donkey just starts making the most almighty sort of hullabaloo um, you know he's really really distressed and, and eventually the farmer in the farmhouse hears this noise and comes running to, to see what's happening and he looks down into the down in, in, into the well and, and sees the the old grey donkey down at the bottom and he scratches his head and, and he thinks to himself Blimmin' donkey, what, 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 how, how am I going to get it out of there? And then he has an idea and he thinks, well, for a little while this donkey's been nothing but trouble. He's old and the well is obviously a bit of a health and safety uh, issue. So maybe if I fill the old well in and bury the donkey at the same, st the same time, I will kill two birds with the same stone. So he calls all his friends and relations from the, from the neighbouring farms and, and tells them to come with their shovels and their spades. And they come. And they all start digging, digging and uh, piling earth down into, into the well on top of the old grey donkey. To begin with, again, the donkey makes, you know, he's 
again really distressed by what what's going on here he's, he's finding the earth is kind of rising up his legs a little bit and then after a short while it all goes quiet and the farmer wondering what's happening sort of puts down his spade and and peers over while his friends and the r relatives and so on are, are still digging and to his surprise what he sees is that as the earth comes tumbling down and lands on the donkey's back he shakes it off and takes a step up every time the earth lands on his back he shakes it off and takes a step up till eventually he's rising slowly and slowly up in the well and he rises to a point where he makes this almighty leap and scrambles up over the edge and runs away to freedom so the metaphor really you know behind that story is that sometimes what seem like the things that are going to bury us you know our greatest challenges can actually be our gifts can can actually be our salvation in disguise um and and i'm a i'm, I'm a firm believer in that you know that our challenges I don't, I don't really believe in broken hearts i believe when things happen really uh, that, that really hurt us and that really cause pain in our heart it's because our heart is breaking open so it's not broken as it it doesn't work anymore it, and it needs fixing it's just broken open a little bit more and i have a kind of image of a like the bud of a rose that's kind of like opening and it seems that in some way you know the pain and the suffering and the challenges that we have in our lives it's just a tool for opening our hearts and the more our hearts open the more we can fully the, the more fully alive we are the more fully we can participate in, in the whole spectrum of life because life is everything it is joy and beauty and bliss and love and happiness but you can't have you can't have light without darkness we live in a world of polarity and, and i believe that there, that there have to be there have to be both and uh so yeah that story of the old gray donkey is a really good reminder for me if ever i get a little bit feeling sorry for myself or things are tricky it's like Miguel there's a gift in this you may not be able to see it yet and I know it's tough but you'll come through this and you'll you'll have grown and you'll be um, you'll be more in your fullness if you like as a result of the experience you were talking about synchronicity um, you mentioned it on the talk and also in your book mm. about um, writing for a paper and also those various other things like um, when you um, have the, the the donkey or the horse with the tied bit of rope round its foot when mm. um, your, your your first girlfriend was giving birth what do you think are the universe is is given to us at, at, at that stage you know for us to have that sort of strange connection because I've, I've had strange connections mm. and things like that happen at some point yeah yes I think the f the first thing that that comes to mind is what it usually seems to be for me is it um, it's a bit like a green light you know a traffic light sort of green light it's like the universe saying yeah Miguel you're on the right track you know it, it's it's kind of like a, a clue you know that 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 you're in alignment um, and and also a reminder that what we perceive with our senses is just the tip of the iceberg you know so it's kind of like you know it's a bit of it don't forget the bigger picture Miguel here you know don't forget the bigger picture and I, I really like this word that I uh, that I learned recently called pronoia which is kind of like the opposite of paranoia uh, and it's about you know the belief that the um, the universe is benevolent and everything that's happening is, is for my highest good um, so yeah I think I think those are some of the um, some of the little gems that, that you know that, that that I draw out of synchronicity yeah now, in your book, you, you mentioned that you really got that sense that enough was enough the way you were living your life and you made that that big change. For those that haven't read the book or been to your talk, what was it really deep within inside yourself that was that first spark of the seed that thinking, I'm, I'm going to make a, a change because sometimes making that change can be pretty frightening for people. Mm. Yeah, it, you know, it becomes that, you know, better the devil we know and, and sometimes the unknown is, is, is scarier than... The, the the known even if the known is painful or it's not particularly comfortable um the the, the first spark for me which i think i uh, i'm not sure that i shared uh, uh, the talk at uh, isborne was when it was the guy that i was actually begging with within edinburgh we sort of like were we sort of like teamed up a little bit and we'd kind of look out for each other and take it in turns and so on but one night he he just taken too much 
something or other and uh, I, yeah I can still sort of see the image quite clearly in front of me he was stood in front of me, in front of me with, a, with a small hand axe in front of his raised above his head and he was really threatening to threatening me and it was at that point that I I just thought Miguel what are you doing with your life you know this is this is your best mate he was kind of like my best mate at the time and I just thought you know perhaps I can do better than this and, and, and there was also a sense of I need to get out of this you know I mean quite a few of my friends had died of overdoses and car crashes and suicides and all sorts of stuff and um it, it that, that really was the beginning and, and it was it I think as, as is often the way I it, it just really hit me that I didn't want to be there any longer or it wasn't safe or it wasn't the right place I hadn't I didn't have a clue where I need what I wanted to get to I knew what I didn't want this is what I'm trying to say I knew what I didn't want very clearly from that moment but I didn't actually know what I did want I didn't really know what the options were and I think on some level I didn't really believe I was worth anything more than that you know it's like I don't want this but uh, you know how do I get out how do I get how do I get out of it you know and do I have really have the motivation and the strength to detach from this world that had become known and familiar to me it had become my life sort of thing how do I go into the unknown and leave all this behind and because there's an isolation in that as well you know the, you know one of the really powerful human needs I believe is the need to belong and I was having that need met to some extent although I was belonging to a highly dysfunctional sort of community at least I was belonging and, and that sense of if I remove myself from this I'm going to be totally alone and I guess in a way that's been one of my greatest nemesis all the way through my life this sort of fear of of, of being totally alone it's something that's uh, yeah that's been a big a big challenge for me you also saying one of the big changes when you had your first counsellor and, and one of the things you really appreciated was his connection, his listening skills. Mm. What do you think it is about truly listening that really helped you and also was there any other things that he did that really helped make that shift for you? Mm. I think the, 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 the first thing that comes to mind is that it was just really apparent that he cared I have seen a few counsellors in my time and but I never came anywhere close to, to being with somebody that it was just so apparent that that he really cared. And and I think, you know, looking back, part of that was again, it's almost like beyond the mind sort of stuff. Uh, there was just a sense that I was being really, really heard. And you know, I, I like to use the word magic really, and magic for me just means stuff that I can't comprehend with my mind really. That that's just I've got no sort of points of reference for. I don't know how it works or whatever, but but it does. And and there seems to be this magic of really deep, heart-centered listening or full-body listening that enables you. It's like it, it's, it's, if all your thoughts are like a big ball of spaghetti or something just the act of listening seems to sort of untangle it all and just straighten it all and bring more clarity so that listening you know I think it's one of the grossly underrated skills there's there's so much that we want to do stuff and you know take action and fix people and stuff but actually just the art of just really being present and really still it's a kind of meditative space really just being really still just can work incredible magic and the other thing that he did was he, he, he asked questions it wasn't like you know he's firing all these questions at me but he, he, he just asked simple questions that made me start exploring or maybe opening kind of closed filing cabinets in my mind that I hadn't opened before because you know, I had not had to so that I think the combination of yeah you know asking powerful questions and really deep listening is you know it, it's second to none really it, it's it's so simple you know and often we just want to really complicate stuff and there are so many different therapies and you know different modalities and ways of um, healing and, and therapy and so on and yeah they all have their place but I think sometimes we get lost in the 
fanciness of all this stuff and if we just come back to just really listening and, and just asking a few simple questions and, and caring you know and from, from that open-hearted space um, yeah well you know I can only speak from my experience but it was the turning point for me is so that you pulled on from when you had that first experience with your counsellor that you still apply today with your coaching with people mm. well yeah there's the, there's definitely the, the listening um, uh, and I think it's something that just gets deeper and deeper you, you know it's not like oh right now I'm a perfect listener it's it's an ongoing practice but 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 to really hear I think and, and in order to do that the questions arise in the in the moment you know it's it's kind of like if you're formulating a question the next question or whatever then you're not actually listening to what's being said so it's just that being really uh, you know i do my best to be as present and, and really listen and trust that when a question you know when there's a pause or when they've finished speaking that, that a question will arise um and, and, and I guess in that uh, as well is not having a fear of silence. It's okay for it to be totally, totally quiet, uh, and and, uh, and actually that's a really important part because although it may be quiet, and we assume that when things are quiet, nothing's happening. That's often when the most is actually happening for the client. That you know, in that space, in that quietness, the insights arise. You know, when there's noise and there's things happening and so on, it, it doesn't give chance for that. Uh, to happen so yeah and, and I guess that that's also part of, of um, yeah just being authentic that's it just, just kind of like being vulnerable I think you know to, I think to really be there to, to help other people you need to be vulnerable yourself because you're expecting them to be vulnerable and, and it's so much easier to be you know vulnerable with somebody that's kind of like modeling that themselves so what, what I'm getting at is that it's okay if a question doesn't arise, or if it, or if it, if it's quiet, or if I don't quite know where to where to go next. I I will always share that with my client. I'll always say, mm, I'm a bit, you know, I'm a bit, I'm, not, I'm a bit unsure of of where we go from here, or you know, I'm I'm feeling a little bit stuck, or and 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 that I find will will put the client at, at ease as well. It's like, oh, this isn't some perfect person and that makes me feel I'm really small and messed up and so on that they're imperfect and they're not quite sure what's happening here so there's a connection in that kind of vulnerability and that, and that honesty yeah. yeah one of the things I know I'm very guilty of and a lot of people that do life coaching counseling hypnotherapy they can find is that you take on what the clients given to you mm. what do you do to help protect yourself from feeling tired after or drained after a session? Mm, that's interesting, actually, because well, a I don't believe in protection. Mm. I don't believe that there's anything that I don't believe that there's anything that I need to protect myself from. And I guess the second thing, well, yeah, the, yeah, the second thing is that it, it just feels like it goes through me. <clears throat> I don't have a sense of anything sticking with me that the client has, has shared with me uh, I just always had this belief that you know what whatever's happening is is going through me almost as if I'm sort of um, transparent you know made of of uh, gas or you know like steam or something like that I don't feel sort of solid um, so there isn't <clears throat> there isn't anything that can stick and I, <clears throat> although perhaps if something does stay with me a little bit what my experience is that that's a gift that you know it's really interesting that often what clients present is something that's current in my life and that then there's something for me to see in that as well so you know if I'm going through a load of relationship stuff or something I find that all my clients are going through relationship stuff so you know I don't believe that it's me giving I believe I sort of see it as a as a cycle that, that uh, there's a giving and receiving in the same thing and that I receive as much from the client as they receive from me so um, yeah yeah I think that about sums that one up oh, that's that's really helpful thank you 
there was a time when you were going to do a trip and you got hepatitis C from an infected tattoo needle mm. and you were very tired, very drained. It also seemed like it was the whole lead up to it was quite a frightening experience for you. Mm. When you were there doing your speeches for people and mingling with people, what did you really pull on yourself? What strength did you find inside you to keep yourself going at that time? <sighs> Oh, Paul, I don't know. God, I haven't thought about that experience for a while. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember it well. It, it was, it was. Yeah, I hadn't slept for probably weeks, and I just felt so ill and so sort of low, and my self-esteem was just zilch. Um, it, it, it was just a. I guess it was. A, it was a sense of. I, j I just need to do this, you know, I, and, and when you've been through tough times, y it's a resource, you know, I can I can pull on that and, and say, look, you've got through this and you've got through that and you've got, the, you just need to be there for a, for, a, for a few hours. And I know the thing that was the most challenging for me was this voice, which I think a lot of us have in our heads is what will people think? It's this, you know, concerned about other people's opinions of us and so on. And... Um, what I'm also very aware of is, is that although I felt, you know, so terrible, other people didn't really seem to see that. You know, it feels it feels as if, you know, there's this great big flashing sign saying totally screwed up, messed up, you know, and all the rest of it. But other people don't 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 see that. Um, and so, yeah, it, it was just it was just. I mean, you know, my Tai Chi Tai Chi teacher um said something to me that, that always sticks with me was that you know there are only two times to do tai chi that's when you feel like it and when you don't feel like it and so you can apply that to life really you know it's like okay there's a load of resistance and i really don't want to do this but i just need to do it and what's the worst thing that's going to happen you know what's the worst thing that's going to happen and invariably the worst thing that's going to happen isn't really a big deal it's just the mind making it out, you know, it kind of magnifies these little things into a great big problem. And and, and also knowing that whenever I go through tough stuff, uh, I will always grow as, as a result of it. Um, and so it's like, OK, here we go. Let's step into the fire again, Miguel. <laughs> yeah. That's one of the things which I was going to mention at some point anyway, is that one of the things I'm working on is what people think of me. And, and that's always been such a, a big thing for me. I think particularly with the work that I do, I kind of think, oh God, you know, um, I'm really messed up there. What will people think of me in the work that I do? Mm -hmm. It seems like very open and honest. How do you, how, what do you do to help get yourself over, over that, what, what people think of me, as you were just saying? Mm. I think it's... Um... It gets easier and easier, and I'm not saying it's, it, it, it is still a bit of a recurring theme, it is still something that pops up, but the more that I get my sense of validation internally from myself, it, it's kind of like a mantra of kind of like, you, you're good enough, Miguel, you know, it, it's okay. When we're looking for external validation, then we're at the mercy of kind of like the winds to be blown, you know, left, right, and centre. You know, somebody says something, oh, you did a really great job, and your and your ego goes, oh, that's lovely, aren't I? Aren't I just the bee's knees? And then some, the next person says, oh, you know, well, I thought that was really terrible, and you really messed that up. And then you like, you know, drop right down. So it's like you end up with this spiky profile of, uh, you know, you're up and down and up and down, and and actually we're only up and down in our minds it's just the mind nothing has actually changed there is this constant that runs through so i guess the key thing that i'm talking about here is is not attaching to what the mind what the running commentary which i, I you know I, I sometimes refer to as shit fm <laughs> you know when shit fm's playing in your head it's just the quicker you can spot oh shit fm's flick the mm. switch and it's back on again the quicker I can turn that off and just quieten that down and just come back to what's happening in the moment and kind of I'm doing okay and some people are going to love me and some people are going to hate me and uh, and, that, and that's okay it's this it's a kind of rootedness I guess in in, in, in yourself in a belief in in what you're doing and and an acceptance that we're imperfect that I will make mistakes and so on and and I think again you know the honesty really helps there because there's if you can just if 
if you do make a mistake and somebody challenges you on it it becomes painful and stuff if you're trying to defend yourself if you just kind of hold your hands up and go yep you know something you're right i did i, I messed up there and uh I'll, I'll you know i'll make a note of that and I'll, I'll do my best to do it differently next time sure thing one of the things that you do mention in your book is how you feel you could have done better in certain c circumstances particularly with relationships would there That's be right. anything that you felt that you had within you that you did pass on to somebody that made their life a little better even in how small um I'd, li I'd like to think that there are all sorts of things that I've passed on to other people that, that, that have made a difference and uh, I see my my mission in the world uh, as the metaphor that, that, that fits best for me is, is gardening really I'm a gardener you know so there's a little bit of preparation of the, with the, of the soil there's a little bit of tending of the relationship and so on um, but invariably what I do is plant a seed and I don't and it's quite often that I'm not around to see what actually germinates and what actually happens to that seed. So, I, you know, I, I really like to think that every every book that's out there is is a little seed and it's made a difference and hopefully it gets passed on to other people. Um, but I do, yeah, I, I meet people sometimes. You know, I'll, I'll meet people that say, "Oh, you know, I heard you speak last year or something," and and you were the sort of you know the, the catalyst that made me finally get my act together and make the change maybe leave the job that, that, that I was doing that I wasn't happy doing and, and, and start working for myself or a few people have, have uh, got back to me and said you know I just loved hearing your story and so on and, and, and it's inspired me to finally write my story um, yeah I've, you know I've had a few really nice testimonials and stuff that, from young people that have said how you know how, how key it, it was uh, you know the time that we had together but often it's yeah it, often it's something that kind of comes to fruition later you know it, it's just I, I sometimes use the traject uh, the sort of metaphor of a sort of tra trajectory that you know let's say that somebody was on, on on their trajectory was heading to a not very good destination the the, my intervention or a talk or the book or some one-to-one -one sessions or a workshop or whatever it might just be that it just gives them a little tiny nudge so that their trajectory is altered slightly and you may not be able to see the difference initially but like a sort of an angle you know the further it goes the bigger the the bigger it becomes obvious that you've ended up in a very different place so I like to think of it like that and uh yeah, you know that not to measure my success or my contribution to the world by the harvest that I reap, but by the seeds that I sow. Um, so yeah, maybe that's a way of saying that um, I, I'm not very good at measuring the impact of what I do, but um, I believe that that it does make a difference, and I have enough little snippets of information. And yeah, it's a tricky question in a way because I think there's a bit of me that actually deletes some of that information as well. Uh, you know, the the, the 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 positive feedback that I get, because you know, whereas the you know the the mind is always you know we're always sort of striving to get better or do more or make a bigger impact, and so if we just focus on all the successes, we could might become a little bit complacent and stuff like that. You know, I'm doing enough now, or just keep it the same. So I think maybe I. Just the fact that I, I can't rem remember anything too, too many really specific examples of that. Um, you probably it's a bit of a I'm not great at blowing my own trumpet. You'd probably have to speak to other people, ask other people that question <laughs> would be a better one to ask. Yeah. yeah, you've done work with younger people, and young people are incredibly influenced by the crowd they're with. What mm. could you say to somebody? that's maybe fearful of saying no with getting involved with a gang, doing something, taking particular drugs or doing mm. some criminal activities, that if they feel that gut feeling it's not right but they want, they feel they should go along with it, what, what, what advice could you give them to help them in that situation? Mm. You see, it's interesting that life seems to get more and more paradoxical and, and, and what, what becomes more and more apparent to me that is if we, if we try and push somebody in a certain direction often what that means is that they just dig their heels in and and you know and, and want to go in that direction less 
Uh, I think that's particularly relevant for young people because you have to find your own way in the world. You have to find your. You have to make your own mistakes. So acceptance is a really key part. You know, for me, it's just accepting somebody fully where they are. It's not trying to change them, and you know I'm not m massive on advice. If I'm asked for advice, then then I'll give advice and say from my experience. But you have to work it out for yourself. Uh, I guess the key thing for me is is just to instill in them some sense of responsibility. That okay, if you're going to join a gang, or if you you, you know you decide you're going to get into something or other, then you're responsible for that, and that means that you're also responsible for the consequences. Uh, you know, I'm not. I'm not sure that I'm really into sort of like right and wrong decisions. I think there are just decisions and just choices. Some of them will lead to pain, which hopefully that we will learn from, and some of them will lead to joy uh, and other places. And um, you know, every everybody will need to take their their own path. But having said that. I think it's always a good idea to, yeah, to, to just think, okay, well, if I embark on this journey, what are the likely destinations that are going to culminate from that? Uh, and, you know, and in a way, you've, you, you've just you've just got to weigh it up. You've got to weigh it up. And if it looks like it's probably going to end up in a not very good place, then maybe you need to think, it, you know, think again. But, uh, and having said that as well, People seem to make choices based on their sense of self-belief and their sense of self-worth. As, as I know, the choices that I made, which in some way I could frame them as wrong choices because they did lead to an awful lot of pain and, and suffering and uh, issues with my health, etc., etc. It was... You know, in a way, I couldn't, have, I couldn't have made another choice. I couldn't have made a choice to go to somewhere really to hook up with a you know a, a beautiful woman and have, have children and, and, and get a, a job that I love doing and live happily ever after because that wasn't in alignment with my journey with, with who I was I needed to go through that um, yeah yeah I'm not uh, I'm not sure how well I answered that question but uh, no, it was good it's answered <laughs> um, I think I like the quote was saying you know when you you're down turn over and look at the stars I, I can't remember the exact expression of it mm, now mm. Um, but there might be somebody listening now that is going through that deep sort of pain what, what, what could you just sort of say from your experience so that they know it's okay to experience that and it will there'll be a, a blessing in disguise so what, what could you, you say about that yeah it, it's going to happen Everybody has adversity. Everybody has challenges in their life. If you if you don't have that, in a way, you haven't fully experienced life. If you just lead, you know. I mean, there's this the story of Siddhartha, isn't there? The the uh, the Buddha that he was in this palace that was all beautiful and he was protected. There weren't any old people around and there was no disease and everything was perfect. But he couldn't handle that. And and one day he saw somebody, an old person. You know, they they hadn't hidden this one little old person and he saw that sort of pain and this decay and, and an old age and stuff and and that drew him and he realized he wanted to go out into the world and you in a, you know that was a pull into into exploring suffering it's a part of what it is to be alive it is it is the pain but the choice that we have i believe is how long we stay in that pain and how quickly we move through it and i would say that the key factor for that is is the mind and what what I notice when I'm going through challenging stuff is that my mind has the tendency to want to give me a hard time for having a hard time so it becomes a double whammy you know things are going not well the mind chirps in with oh this is your fault and you're useless and you're stupid and you deserve it or you'll never you know you'll never be lovable or and all that sort of stuff so the more we can sort of like catch shit FM playing and, and just quieting it down and just bring our attention back to actually what we're feeling, you know, what, what are the emotions, what's actually happening in your body, the more that you can actually have the courage to actually be present with what's going on, the quicker 
it will transform the quicker the the the, the emotional stuff sort of shifts once the emotional stuff shifts we can begin to see things more clearly because emotions often feel a bit to me like a fog they descend and, and nothing's clear you know it's not a good time to be making decisions and so on but the more we're present with the pain of the emotion the quicker it transforms and the quicker we can begin to see our way and you know our way forward or the, the path begins to kind of present itself so yeah that you know don't give yourself a hard time if, if you're having a hard time then it, it everybody else is having a hard time as well they all be, may be wearing masks of oh yeah i'm cool i'm fine and everything's cool in my world but that's not true that's kind of a strange thing that has just arisen in our society that, that we tend to do that so you're not alone don't isolate yourself be vulnerable and connect with other people and share that you're struggling and so on with some with people that care about you uh, or other people that are perhaps you know struggling in similar ways you, you know the sort of um, AA sort of model is a classic one that you know re recovering alcoholics come together and they meet and they talk about their experience and, and in that sharedness in that vulnerability there is healing and there's strength that comes from that yeah that's very good if anybody wants to get hold of your excellent book or book you for a workshop or private coaching how can they get in contact with you okay um well my email address is coaching at migueldean.co.uk my website is www.migueldean.net um and uh, i'm pretty big on facebook so yeah you can find me on facebook as well i'm very active on facebook i, I see facebook as a as a window of hope and inspiration and, and, and so on into the world so I, I really like sort of putting stuff up there on Facebook that will help people and uh, challenge and get people thinking and stuff um, so yeah that's probably the I think you, if, if you want to find me you'll find me so you were saying that yeah. this book you said that instead of it collecting dust mm -hmm. and it's not to make money it's to really share the love around mm -hmm. Each one of us, I believe, has a seed within inside us that we can leave to inspire. Might not we've had books, but there's something mm. magical in each side, each one of us. Yeah. What could we do as individuals to help pass on that seed to help wonderful things grow in other people? Okay, yeah. Okay, so, so yeah, I, I agree. I, be I believe that we all have a seed or we all have a gift. We all, you know, the incredible thing is there, you know, there are seven billion odd people on the planet and every single one is unique and that means for me that in a way everybody has a absolute unique gift if you like part of the life journey for me is initially just discovering what is my gift what is my purpose what am i what am i here for so it may be that you just have to try lots of different things and you know maybe you get pulled in a certain direction and check that out and you may find well no that's not quite it that doesn't it's the things that light you up it's the things that make you feel in flow i think that they talk about don't they when you feel in flow and when you feel really in alignment and when you feel really really alive that's a good sign for for me that that you're that you've you're close or that you found your life purpose your life gift uh, it's a bit like that game that you used to play when you were little, that, you know, and it's kind of like you hide something and somebody has to look for it and you say hotter or colder. So, you know, the, the, the more alive you feel, the closer you are to finding your gift, your unique reason why you're here in this body on this planet. So once you've found that, then, you know, it, it's no good keeping it to yourself. When you find that thing, you, you'll find that you can't keep it to yourself. You just want to share it. You just want to give it. And... Uh, you know yeah it just kind of it moves me just speaking about it just imagine what the world would be like if if that was what we were taught at school your 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 what the reason that you're here is to find your gift and when you found it to share it and you know because it, it will shrivel and die if you just keep it to yourself it grows and it into something beautiful uh, when you start sharing it what a you know co-creation collaboration and you know what a beautiful rich garden uh, life would be then anything else you'd like to say that I haven't mentioned so far I guess what's really 
passionate in me at the moment and increasingly kind of like growing in in in, in power in me is just you know what's going on in the world um what what is what we're doing to the environment you know the injustice that that, that, that we're inflicting on other human beings on and, and, and on non-human beings and i believe that we can that we can all do something about that it's we all we it, we are all responsible for uh, you know for for what's happening in the world and uh, my message is always um you know lots of little things add up into big change you know there's a really nice um little saying that says you know if you believe that you are too small to make a difference try spending a night in a tent with a mosquito so you know it's or never think that a little act of kindness or um, just sharing your gifts a little bit or just a little bit of time for somebody is insignificant and it's not worth anything this stuff is not measurable in a linear sort of perspective if you do something kind um, out of kindness and, and, and from love it's like a, a little pebble in a pond you don't know how far those ripples are, are, are going to spread out and if if we all if if everybody just steps that up a little bit for me that's kind of loving action and that's you know the sort of spiritual term is perhaps raising consciousness and it's all those little things that will help transform this beautiful planet that we live on into a more beautiful place that is more loving and, and fairer and uh you know i believe that we can have heaven on earth and uh for me that's those little those little acts of kindness from love will be instrumental are instrumental because it's already happening in, in creating that Miguel thank you for your time today that was amazing <laughs> you're very welcome thank you as I'm sure you will agree quite an inspirational story the main points that I really learned from this interview was that the act of real deep listening fully understand the person you're communicating with and to not be worried about leaving silence. Sometimes silence is important, sometimes silence can be very healing and the act of vulnerability, I've heard it before with Dr David Hamilton and I've read it in many other books but I truly believe that if we were all just that little bit more vulnerable and removed our masks we would feel that there's less we need to prove and in doing so it may well make the world a happier place and finally share a seed of knowledge or spread your love you may well wish to leave a comment and that being one of your favorite quotes that somebody come into this youtube video will find inspiring you may well wish to share this interview with somebody or maybe you have a skill or a resource you like to pass on to a loved one. Whatever it is, I encourage you to not just hold on to it yourself, but to give, give freely, give from the heart. If you enjoyed listening to this interview, then please subscribe to my channel. Also like and share. For more information about Miguel Dean, you can go to his website, www miguelDean.net and for more information about how NLP and hypnotherapy can help move your life forward then please go to my website www.paulgoddardnlp.co.uk On both our websites there are links to our social media pages Until the next time, be kind and compassionate to yourselves and others